one? It's good to be back. I've been, I've been traveling. Last week I was with the young adults at the Young Adult Sabbath with, uh, well, with the conference. The week before I was at Camp Akita for family camp. The week before I was at Camp Akita for adventure camp. The week before that I was again at Camp Akita for adventure outpost. And then I think before that I was here. But it's been a while since I've been back. And a few things have changed. I, uh, maybe some of you noticed that I look a little bit different. <laughs> I'm trying to make myself look a little bit older, but uh, maybe it succeeds, maybe it won't. I'm just bringing it up right now. Let's bow our heads and let's say a word of prayer. Dear Lord, as we come before you this morning, we want to ask for your blessing. We want to thank you for the way that you love us. And we know that in the things that we do and the way that blessings come in our life, we know that you love us. So, dear Lord, thank you for that reminder in the, in the song by Jeff and Hillary. We want to thank you for this time of just spending time in your word. We want to ask your blessing on our service, on our message, and on our fellowship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the title of my talk is called As They Went. And I'll start with a quote. It says, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what a ship is built for. How many of you are the same person in the church as you are outside of the church? I didn't think people were going to raise their hands. When I was in in college, I started to learn about God. And... I was doing a lot of stuff in church, but I did not want my friends outside of the church to see what I was doing. I didn't want my friends outside the church to know that I was a Christian. I didn't want them to know that I taught Sabbath school or that I helped out. I wanted to hide, and I just wanted to be somebody different. Because I thought, if they knew how I was at church, and they knew how I was outside of church, and they would see that there was a difference that they would have a lot of questions. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to step out and show that I was somebody different. I'm going to ask you this. You don't need to answer, but just think about it. Some of you lead out in church here. Some of you are up in front. You're singing. You're doing other stuff. You're teaching Sabbath school. At your workplace, are you a leader? If you're a leader in church, are you a leader outside? Are you really friendly to people outside of the church, but you come to church and you speak to nobody? Do your, does your character, does it match? Or is one of them pretend? And I'm not going to ask you which one is pretend. But I'm going to say that a lot of us have two different characters. What we show to people in the church and what we show to people outside. So I was in college and I had entered... How many of you are going to college for the first time? Actually, you guys are probably not here. Um, I know some of you are starting college. I know some of you are starting school. I started at a, at a place called John Abbott College in this place called St. Anne de Bellevue in Canada. And there was an English class. And the teacher said, all right, everybody, I want you to form into groups. We're going to read Shakespeare's um, To Be or Not To Be speech. How many of you know this speech? It says, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether to snobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing them, end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by sleep, perchance, to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal plane must give us pause. So I had to memorize this in grade nine. But in, in college, they made, the, the teacher said, I want you guys to divide into groups. You need to choose a leader. And I want you to find a creative way to share this poem. Now, do you know what the poem To Be or Not To Be is about? It's about suicide. Hamlet is saying to be, that's to exist, or not to be, to not exist. That is the question. And he's out there and he's thinking, should I kill myself or not? That's not really the most appropriate thing to talk about Sabbath morning, right? I'm not planning to do that, but... We were there in the class, and everybody was sitting by themselves in one group, like we do for AY. And they're like, who's going to be the leader? 
In class, when I was in college, I spoke to nobody. I was really, really, really shy. And I'm one of the people that I was hoping that somebody else would raise their hand because I didn't want to speak up. And so we're all sitting together and nobody says a word and we don't even know each other. And I start to pray. I'm like, dear Lord, why is nobody speaking up? Somebody can lead it. And God said to me, he's like, why don't you lead up? You lead people in church, you do stuff. Why can't you speak up? And I'm like, I don't want to. (laughs) I didn't feel like it. And he's like, just go. And finally, like, everybody's silent. And you know how silence can get really awkward? You're trying to find out who's going to do it and nobody's saying anything. Finally, I said, I, and I I said something and they're like, hey, he said something. Okay, what, what do we do? (laughs) And I was like, I have an idea. So I, I told them, I said, everybody just, I don't know, we'll read two verses, two lines from it, but we're going to spread out all over the room. And so I want you to be at this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner. And as we read it together, I want you to like, to step up to read it and to walk forward until all of us come to the center. And they were like, okay, why not? And the teacher's like, time's up, because we had waited so long in silence to see who was going to be the leader. And so we did that. We said, to be or not to be, that is the question. And we did that from different parts of the room, and we started coming together. And the teacher really liked it. He said, you know what? That's a really good illustration. It's like Hamlet is gathering his thoughts from all over the place, and he's trying to make it into something really, really clear. I realized two things. I mean, English was one of my favorite classes, and I really, really love that class. But the second thing I realized is that if you are a leader in church, you can be a leader in the real world. If you're friendly in church, you can be friendly in the real world. At the same time, if you are a fun person and you love doing tons of stuff in the world, you can do that in the church. You can have the same personality that you have outside as you have on the inside. You don't need to have two separate personalities. Amen? God tells us we're supposed to go. He says, I want you to go into all the world and do these things. When I was at Camp Akita, I had to preach 13 times. In the morning and in the evening, every single day for a week. And the theme was go. Now, God told us to go. Three reasons, here's three reasons not to go. Number one, they're going to say, you know what? Someone else is better than me. This person sings better than me, so I'm not going to sing. This person preaches better than me, I'm not going to preach. This person teaches better than me, I'm not going to teach. This person cooks better than me, this person is kinder. They start to compare and they're like, you know what? I'm not qualified, therefore I am not going to go. Second reason is fear. People think they're going to mess up. They're like, I'm going to try this, I'm going to slip, and everyone's going to make fun of me. So the second reason why people don't want to go is they're scared. They're scared of failure. The third one is sloth. This is laziness. This is like, I don't want to do this. I'll do it tomorrow or later. It's procrastination. We have three main reasons why people don't go. They compare themselves to others. We compel ourselves to others. We're scared that we're going to fail or we're too lazy to go out and move. Does this resonate with anybody here? Wow. All right. So the Great Commission says this. And I was looking at this a few days ago. And this is the New King James Version. It says, go therefore and do what? Make disciples. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I saw it in different Bible versions, what would it say? So go therefore, make disciples of all nations. I looked it up in the NIV. NIV says, therefore what? Go, make disciples of all nations. I'm like, okay. ESV, English Standard Version. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And then I switched to New Living Translation. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And I'm like, wow, it's the same word in every single English translation. And then I went to the Greek and I said, what does it say? Do you know what it says? Having gone, disciple all the nations. And I thought about that and I'm like, why does it say that in the English? So it doesn't just say go. Having gone, having made that decision to step out of your comfort zone and to do something different, that's when it says to disciple all nations. So they all say go, but the last one says having gone, disciple all nations. The only way we can see stuff is to watch God go. 
I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew 28. And please say amen when you're there. Matthew 28. I'm going to put this here. Now, after the Sabbath, amen, are we there? I'm going to show up one, show one verse, but let's go to Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, who came? Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. For behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning. His clothing was as white as the snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said this to the women. Oops. The angel answered and said this to the woman. He said, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek who? Jesus. The women came to the tomb looking for Jesus. But was he there? He was not there. The angel said, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And the angel tells them this, I want you to go. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. I ask myself, does the phrase having gone, does that match the rest of the Bible interpretation? We always hear go. But if it says having gone, does that match somewhere else in the Bible? So in Matthew 28, the women are told they're looking for Jesus. And the Bible tells them, the angel tells them to go. Tell the disciples. Now look at verse 9. It says, as they went, what happened? Behold, Jesus what? He met them. They were looking for Jesus. Jesus only appeared after they, as they as they went, as they went. Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee. Now, that's the same message the angel said. Only this time, Jesus appeared. Jesus, they went, I'm going to go back. They went to look for Jesus. He said, don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus. He's not here. I want you to go. And then the next verse says, as they went, Jesus appears. That has a lot to do with faith. God can tell us to go, but until we step forward, we don't know what God is going to do. So he says, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee. Now, this is the same chapter. And Jesus appears to them in Galilee. And it says the 11 disciples, remember they were told by the women to go to Galilee. The 11 disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped. The disciples were told, go. And when they went, that's when they saw Jesus. When we are told, go, that's not necessarily when we're going to see Jesus. It's only when, when we go. As, we, as, as they went. I can't say as, when, as we went. As, as you go, that's when you see Jesus. Four reasons to go. It is the only way to real growth. It is the only way that true faith develops. We know that things are true because we decide to test it. It's an alternative to boredom and stagnation which causes people to wither and die. And it's part of discovering and obeying your calling. So having gone, disciple the nations. Now, last week, Uncle Bing shared a sermon about this chapter. Do you know what this chapter is about? Do you remember this? Peter has a vision. And he says, and he sees all these animals. Can we eat those animals? No, we're told we should not eat those animals. And he calls this unclean. And he keeps hearing a voice saying, kill and eat. And he's like, I've never eaten anything unclean. And while Peter thought about the vision, this is Acts 10, verse 19 and 20. The Spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Arise and do what? Go, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So the voice tells Peter, go. And he actually goes and he meets these people. And he converts them. Like, he meets Cornelius. He has their whole family gathered together. And they say to him, they start asking him all these questions. And they say, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what the Holy Spirit says. And they, he starts preaching to them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. 
And he says, I see very clearly God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and those who do what is right. Peter had a problem of racism. A lot of the Jews did at that time. They only went to their own nationality. They did not go to other people. And God told him, Peter, I have a dream for you and I want you to go. Peter went and that's when he understood that the gospel was open to the Gentiles. It's not enough to just hear the word go. We need to go as well. Now, look at this. This is Acts 10. Acts 10, 34 and 35. And the, they were told to disciple how many nations? All the nations. So Peter gets it. In Acts 10, Peter gets it. He's supposed to go because in every nation, God accepts those who fear him and those who do what is right. Acts 10. In Acts 11, it says there had been those who had been scattered by the persecution that had broken out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. These are the disciples. They spread out, spreading the word only among who? The Jews. So even though Peter gets it, they're still reaching only Jewish people. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, and they began to teach the Greeks also, telling them about the good news of the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of those people believed and turned to the Lord. Okay. Peter was told to go. And they were told to go and spread out and reach the God, bring the gospel to all the world. But some people only spread it out among their own nationality. They would not go and tell other people. And some others, they went and started telling it to the Greeks. And they went and a lot of people came to God. Can everybody see this picture clearly? This is Adventure Outpost in Camp Akita. This is the staff and the campers that were there with me. How many of them are Filipino? You know what? None of them. Not a single person there was Filipino. You know who was there from our church? Carl, Carl was there. He wasn't there this week. He had just left. But he was there. You know who else came from our church? No, well, besides me. Jade. Jade, Jade Veal. The, I don't know if Jade's here. It's, I think I saw her somewhere. Everybody else here is not Filipino. Now, I connected with these people. I connected with them really well. And by, at the end of it, I got the chance to pray for every single one of them. I spoke to every single person there for at least an hour to an hour and a half, getting to know them, praying with them. You know what happened at the end of the week? Three of them said they want to get baptized. Four of them said they want to join our church. Um, it's, it's amazing. And we did a Bible study on Saturday night. Some people wanted to go to the lake, and others are like, Pastor David, we want to ask you questions. I said, Sure. And we started to study about Daniel and Revelation. How many of you have studied Daniel and Revelation? How many of you have never studied Daniel and Revelation? Okay. I'm going to say that there's a lot of the youth in our church that don't know Daniel and Revelation super well. I'm going to say also that we started sharing stuff about the Bible, and they had so many questions. And I was showing them some stuff in Revelation. And at the end of it, like, because it started gathering, more and more people started to come, and one of the girls... She's like, I'm a fourth generation Adventist. I have not heard this stuff about Daniel and Revelation. And another person that's leading praise, she's like, I've never heard this before. Where are you getting this from? And I said, this is basic Bible stuff. You guys never learned this stuff in school? I said, and they're, and they're like, no, we've been to Adventist education, but we're not hearing about Daniel and Revelation. We're not hearing about the prophecies. But we want to learn. We want to know. We love God. We just don't understand the prophecies and why they're relevant. I'm going to leave that for a second. Um, what do we do? What do we do when people want to know? Are we just going out to Filipinos? Are we just going out to our families? Are we just going out to our church and trying to bring our church to a knowledge of God, but not actually going out and sharing with other people? These are other nationalities. In other churches, too, they don't know what's going on. They don't understand the things about Daniel and Revelation. And that's, for me, that's a problem. Because multiple generations of youth have 
come. I don't know how long it's been since you've had a Daniel and Revelation seminar here in the church. But this is something that we, we as the pastors want to bring back to the church to just get people to know what is going on. I'm going to... Actually, I'm going to skip that for a second. We have this thing coming up. Pastor Mark, told, it's an evangelistic series. From what dates? October 21 to 31. You know what our topic is going to be? It's going to be final events. Daniel Revelation. Before, for building up into this, um, starting from September all the way to the start of October, you'll see a theme in our sermons. And they'll be talking about Daniel and about Revelation. I'm going to share some things that I've been learning in seminary. Pastor Mark will be sharing some things. And, we're just, and Uncle Bing is going to be sharing some things too. And we're going, to, we're going to try to prepare everybody here to understand Daniel and Revelation a little bit better. And if you have questions, if you haven't studied that, if you know people that want to study this, some friends, maybe some coworkers, maybe some other nationalities too, invite them. Get them to start because they might really be interested in it. What is this? Does anybody know what this is? This is the list of spiritual gifts. How many of you remember doing the spiritual gift survey? Okay, some of you are, some people, how many of you never did this before? Okay. There's teaching, there's evangelism, administration, but there's also helps, exhortation, leadership, discernment, hospitality. When God says go, God does not say, I want you to become a pastor or a missionary. God says, I want you to take these gifts and I want you to use these gifts to reach out to other people. Do you have the gift? Of, how many of you have the gift of hospitality? Do you know what that is? Hospitality is being good at welcoming people. Can you use that somewhere else? Can you connect with people using that gift? Are you good at administration? Maybe you're a really good administrator in your work. Can you use that for God? When God says go, he's not telling us become a pastor, become a missionary. He's saying, I want you to go and use the gifts that you've been given. We're using this for the ministry management teams. Have you guys heard about this? Yes? The ministry management teams. Do you know what this is? We don't have nominating committee this year. We have the ministry management team. All right. If you're not sure what it is, see Uncle Mud. <laughs> oh, it's not there. Okay. I want you to imagine that there's a circle around me. Okay, this is my circle of comfort. I like being in my circle. I don't want to step outside my circle of comfort and reach other people because I'm shy. I'm scared. I look at my gifts and I'm like, you know what? I'm not good at this. But there, are, but there are people out there that need the gifts we have. Ellen White has this quote. She says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. Do you like hospitality? If you're good at hospitality, why not invite your coworkers or your classmates to a lunch or a dinner together at your house? If you're good at encouragement, why not, pray, why not check out who's down and try to like, lift them up? If you're good at helping people, why not help volunteer? Get involved. I'm not telling you to go preach to the people. I'm telling you mingle with the people. Get to know them. Become better friends with the people you don't really know. If you have a different personality outside of church than you do inside a church, then the people you know outside of the church are different from the people you know inside. But that means that you can reach them. That means you can connect them. Get to know them better. And also help them to realize that maybe you believe in God too. And you have something you can share with them. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for what? For their needs, he min for, their, for them, he ministered to their needs, won their confidence. And then he said, come, follow me. We started, as we started something a year ago. And I w I'd like to, we'd like to continue it this, this time around. Last year, around the time of August, July, we had a youth leader dedication. And we said that we want to do something different with our church. We want to take the youth leaders, we want to invite them up here, and we want to lay hands on them. And we want to do that here too. We want to invite the youth leaders, the, the existing ones, the youth advisors, to come up 
And we have two new youth leaders that are, that are going to be joining us. Um, can I ask you guys to come up? And I'd like to ask the youth leadership team to come up. The two, two of our youth leaders are going to be going. Um, well, not entirely going, but just stepping away for a little bit. One of them is Carl. The other one is Adrian. Um, and we've been talking among ourselves, and we decided to train another generation. And we see two youth that we, that we decided to vote on to say, hey, we want them to help out in the leadership team too. One of them is Ruben. And the other one is Bella. And what we'd like to do is to represent the, this is our youth leadership team. I think we're missing, we're missing a few people. We're missing Milen, and we're missing Stacy, who's in England right now. But I want to invite you to, to pray with us for our youth leadership team. We've made a lot of changes last year. And this year, like, one of the changes was to make people mingle more together. But this year, I want our focus to be outreach. We want to take this group, and we want to reach out to our friends, to our families, to the people that don't know about God. And that's, that's what we want our focus to be this time around. I'd like to invite the elders to come up, and I'd like to ask that we lay hands on them. I'd like to invite the elders, I'd like to invite the youth, and then I'd like to invite everybody to come and stand. Let's get the elders. Am I speaking out loud? Maybe come closer? Let, let's kneel. Let's kneel. And I'd like to ask Pastor Mark to offer a special prayer everyone the i'd like to request the congregation as well to please uh, join us in our prayer wherever you are elders if you could lay your hands to our let us pray father in heaven i praise you oh god for calling our young people to your ministry I praise you, O Lord, for the gifts you have given them and that they have dedicated themselves to serve you. All glory and honor to your holy name. Father in heaven, it is my personal joy to see our young people leading our church today. When the youth leads, the church is being moved and empowered, O God. And I pray and I ask your spirit to pour upon our youth leaders and upon our youth that they will feel the fire of faith that they will live their lives separate, distinct and different from this world and they will tell other young people that there is a God in heaven that there is a God who promised that He will come again and that He will change that God will use our young people to change our mediocrity and our lukewarmness. Lord, I dedicate to you our leaders today. Holy Spirit, may your may your influence mold their lives. That their parents, that their siblings, that their uncles and aunties, grandmas and grandpas, and whoever will come in contact with them will, will tell the world, they will tell others, indeed they have been. And they have seen Jesus through their example. Father in heaven, please put them, them a wedge of protection. Father in heaven, may they will dedicate their lives to study your holy word every morning. To begin with a prayer. To tell their families to worship you in the morning and in the evening to remind them that you are first in their lives. Together with the church, we ask for the special protection. Watch over them, their father, as they study, as they mingle with their peers, and as they witness for you. May the fire of Jesus Christ's love be in their hearts and they will tell the world, that there is a God who is coming very soon. His name is Jesus Christ. And so I would like to commit them to you today, together with the whole church. 
I pray this in the name of the Father. I pray this in the name of the Son. I pray this in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let's go and change the world. Amen and amen.